morning, everybody. My name is Neil Wayne. I'm with Vesta Property Services. I'm the West Central Florida Operations Manager based out of our Brandon office. Um, today's uh, uh, host uh, is myself and Aaron Silverman. Uh, we'll be uh, providing you with a nice, uh, some, hopefully some educational um, uh, slides going forward. And uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Aaron so that we can go ahead and continue. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Aaron Silverman. I'm a board, sort of, uh, board certified condominium and plan development lawyer. Um, I've had my own firm for nine years, but I've been practicing for over 15. And this is, this is what our, our, our firm does. We represent condos and homeowners associations. Uh, we work with um, well over 100 uh, in the Tampa Bay area and focus on all different types of, uh, of, of their, their practices and, and their needs. Um, today, we're going to be talking about something that we do day in and day out, and that's amending governing documents. Um, but before we get started, uh, we go to the next slide. Um, it wouldn't be a presentation from a lawyer unless I gave you a nice disclaimer at the beginning saying that this is not legal advice. I don't have your documents in front of me. Um, uh, most of you uh, on, the, uh, on this webinar have your own counsel um, if you're on your board, so make sure you bring up questions uh, and thoughts to them. Um, and the governing documents for your community is going to um, it greatly impact the analysis when it comes to uh, different amendments that might be available to you. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so bef before we kind of dive in, it's important to consider the limitations on amendments. Um, federal and state laws do have certain um, aspects to them that would prevent you from amending certain provisions in your documents such as the Fair Housing Act, federal law, which you, um, I know a lot of you, if you're on your boards, you're familiar with the emotional assistance animals and how you have to grant reasonable accommodations under the Fair Housing Act, regardless of what your documents say. Um, satellite dishes, there's the Telecommunications Act, which in condos and HOAs, it places limitations on what uh, an, an HOA uh, or condo is able to restrict in connection with satellite dishes, regardless of what your documents say. And then renewable energy sources. There's a statutory section in Florida, 163.04, which um, does not allow certain um, restrictions to exist within your documents that would um, impede or prohibit certain types of renewable energy sources, including, yes, clotheslines um, that I know a lot of communities uh, 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 deal with. Um, we can go on to the next slide. So first, let's talk about permissive versus mandatory statutes. Because if it's a mandatory statute, you can't necessarily amend around it. But if it's permissive, you can. Um, so the statutes may be permissive if your documents provide for this kind of language, or the statutes rather, provide for this kind of language, unless otherwise provided in your governing documents. A lot of statutes have that language, such as meeting notice provisions. Unless otherwise provided in your governing documents, 14 days notice must be provided before any membership meeting. So if you have 30 days, then it's 30 days notice. So, and that's an example of a permissive um, statutory requirement that you can amend around. Mandatory statutes, um, you can amend around. So if you're in a chapter 718 condo and you want to um, amend around uh, certain election procedures and certain other requirements, there may be things that you cannot necessarily amend out of your documents. Um, and it requires uh, getting with your attorney to go through kind of a, a detailed analysis of what is okay, what is not okay, um, before you get too deep into the weeds trying to kind of pull things out of your docs or make changes. On to the next slide. I know this is elementary to, to most folks who are on their board, but within the three types of uh, the three main types of community associations, there are different types of documents. If you're in a condominium, you have a declaration of condominium. You also have articles of incorporation, bylaws, and rules. If you're in a homeowners association, it's typically a declaration of covenants and restrictions. And if you're in a cooperative, it is a proprietary lease and share in the actual corporation. Next slide. And there's a hierarchy among your documents. 
So if you are a board who likes to adopt a lot of different rules, you can adopt rules if you have the authority to do so. Um, and we'll talk about that later, but you cannot adopt rules that are in conflict with any of the documents above, um, above the rules in this chart. So the bylaws are gonna control over the rules, the articles control over bylaws and rules and the declaration controls over everything. Um, and, and that's important to keep in mind when you're doing a large amendment project, or let's say your bylaws have, a, have an easier amendment procedure. So you wanna make certain changes, you can, you just can't be in conflict with the articles or the declaration. Next slide. So <clears throat> this is the statutory default. The vast majority, 95, 98% of condominium and HOA documents have an amendment procedure included within them. However, sometimes it was inadvertently um, left out. And if you don't have an amendment procedure in your documents, it requires two thirds of all voting interests to amend. Now, certain things, um, and if you're in a condominium, I'm sure you, you're familiar with this, but amendments affecting certain leasing rights, such as the ability to lease or the term of the lease will only impact those people who consent to it or acquire title to the unit after the effective date. But it's two thirds of all owners or all the voting interests, unless your documents provide otherwise. All right, next slide. So when you're talking about amending your, your, your declaration, um, <clears throat> you may have a situation where you want to amend one small provision. <clears throat> and that's what you've done over the years, where you have amended one issue here, one issue there. And if you're like some of my clients, you have 15 amendments and trying to figure out what is applicable to what is a whole endeavor because you have to go through 15 different amendments to figure out what is the current state of your governing documents? So there are a lot of different things you can do in connection with amending your declaration. When I have a client who comes to me and they have those 15 amendments, one of the things we'll talk to them about doing is to, to consider amending and restating, their, and restating their documents. And what I mean by that is we will take all 15 of those amendments, we will consolidate them into one document which gives us the starting point, what your documents currently are. Um, so if you have 15 amendments, all those amendments are already part of your declaration. And at that point, we will then amend further from there. So at the end of the process, you're left with one clean document, easy to review, easy to search through. Um, and it makes things worlds easier for not only your existing owners, but new owners um, and potential new owners. Um, one of the other things that we deal with frequently is people want to eliminate a lot of language relating to the developer where it's obsolete. Um, I think uh, over half of most articles of incorporation when it's uh, init they're initially filed refer to the developer and the developer officers and directors and they have no applicability anymore. So we frequently remove all of the references to the developer. Um, one of the other things that comes up all the time and a question that it's, it's raised is, well, it's really hard for us to amend because we need 75% of all owners because that's what our documents say. All owners, 75% have to approve an amendment. So we could take a lot of time and a lot of the association's resources in preparing a comprehensive set of amendments only to send it out to the membership and it doesn't get approved. So what we recommend is what we always refer to as a two-step amendment procedure. Let's first amend the amendment procedure. Let's see if your members are agreeable to making it easier to amend. And let's say you have that 75% uh, requirement for amendments. What we'll suggest is let's say you have 75, let's amend it to say 75% of those that participate where you have a quorum. This helps in a number of different ways. Number one, it doesn't uh, automatically um, cause a failure to vote to become a no, but it also makes it uh, uh, palatable to the owners who say, well, now the board is in charge of everything. And the response to that kind of uh, objection, which we hear all the time is, listen, if 100% 
of your owners participate, there's no functional change in your amendment procedure. All we are doing is removing the automatic no from certain owners apathy. And that is, is understood by a lot of our clients. You can spend an hour or two in attorney's fees and costs to prepare your proxy and your amendments um, and get that procedure kind of wrapped up before you spend thousands of dollars on comprehensive amendments that may never go anywhere. So that, that's something to keep in mind. Going on to the next slide. So assessments and budgeting. Uh, frequently, whenever we get involved and we're working on um, uh, amendments to the declaration and bylaws, we want to maximize the rights to recover from purchasers in foreclosure. So some documents that were drafted some time ago say that the obligation to pay assessments does not, um, does not uh, transfer to anyone who acquires title by foreclosure or deed in lieu of foreclosure. If that language is in your documents, it doesn't matter what the statute says. There have been recent cases that have come out that have said your, your, your governing documents are gonna control. So we can help you to remove that kind of language. So if you have a collection um, issue in your community and it does sell uh, or, and the lender forecloses, then the new owner who takes title, a third party, not the lender, there's limitations on lender liability, but the third party will not, um, be able to skirt around the former owner's uh, assessment obligations. Um, additionally, there's amendments that can be done to change the support is this, the superiority of the lien over second mortgages. So, the statute provides that first mortgages have first lend, mortgage holders, first uh, lenders have the protection, but not second mortgage holders and third mortgage holders. Um, However, a lot of documents say any mortgage is protected. Now, we would have to do an analysis and, and discuss with you whether you can change that without lender approval and consent, um, but that's something to consider. Limits on budget increases um, and limits on assessment increases. Within condo law, um, the statute allows for an increase in the operating budget up to 15% without a vote of the owners. There's no limit in the statute for HOAs. But if you're in an HOA and you want to make sure that you don't have a future board, because no one on your, no one on this call, I'm sure, uh, are, are part of a, a rogue board. But if you want to make sure a future board doesn't jack up the assessments 50% every year, year over year, then you can include language in your in your documents to put a cap on that. The same thing in connection with capital expenditures, and you can even include um, limitation of liability to adopt special assessments for capital expenditures. Now I say that with a caveat. If you have language in your documents that requires you to have a super majority vote of owners before you, um, before you adopt any special assessment, include a limitation um, or an exception for situations where the association is obligated to maintain certain items because then your association is not going to be put in a position where you have to maintain your perimeter wall. You have to maintain your clubhouse and you have to specially assess for it, but the owners have to approve it because it puts you kind of in a difficult spot. Next slide, please. Alterations and improvements. If you're in a condominium, I'm sure your uh, attorney has told you that you cannot make material alterations, additions, or improvements unless 75% of all units vote in favor of it. Now, that's the default language in the statute. A lot of governing documents have different language. Um, if you're not familiar with this, a, a material alteration, addition, or improvement has been found by uh, the Division of Florida Condominiums and courts to essentially be very small changes. It can be, and one, one of these arbitration opinions said, changing the color of pool furniture cushions was a material alteration that required a 75% vote of all owners. So whenever we're working with our condo clients, we recommend that you include amendments in your declaration that gives the board essentially a certain amount that they can spend during the course of the year 
without it being considered a material alteration requiring a unit owner vote, such as $10,000 or 3% of your operating budget. That way, if the board needs to replace a piece of furniture in the lobby or wants to replace um, the, the pool furniture cushions with a different color or wants to install a, a surveillance camera in a new location, they don't have to come to the membership for a vote. That's something that we frequently get asked questions on. HOAs do not generally have alteration provisions. Some of them do. Some associations want to, uh, some HOAs want to amend their documents to add alteration provisions. So a board cannot um, install a playground within a, a common area park that's currently a field um, without owner approval. Just an example of something because that same limitation that's within the condo statute, most condo docs, does not exist um, within the, um, the HOA statute and most HOA docs. Uh, next slide. So maintenance provisions. If you're in a condo and you have unit boundaries and limited common elements, um, you know, you, typically in a condo, your boundaries are your unfinished interior surface of the drywall in. Everything else is considered a common element subject to uh, most of the time maintenance, repair and replacement by the uh, association. Limited common elements would be things such as your balcony or patio um, or anything else that's identified within your declaration or on your plat documents. You can't change unit boundaries without 100% vote in a condo. However, you can label a common element, a limited common element, and have an individual owner become responsible for the limited common element. An example would be um, uh, balcony floor coverings, um, where you can have an owner responsible. You can change the balcony from a common element to a limited common element if it's not already that way, and then have the individual owner be responsible for the maintenance of that limited common element. Another example would be the, um, the HVAC lines that run from the one HVAC, one HVAC system servicing one unit to the, um, uh, uh, from wherever the unit is to the, to the unit itself to have those lines be classified as a limited common element and subject to the maintenance obligations of the individual owner. A lot of things are, are, are items that you have to look at on a case by case basis, looking at how your building is constructed, um, where these items are located and how and if you wanna shift certain maintenance obligations. The other thing to think about is um, loss reduction allocation issues. So one of the things that, um, comes up quite frequently if you're in a high-rise condo or if you're in townhomes, which is a, you know attached HOA community, then you deal with water intrusion problems. Somebody left for vacation and they left the water running. Well, when we work on amendments, a lot of times we'll say, okay, so why don't we include language in the documents that require anyone who is out who has left their unit vacant for more than five days? or seven days, they have an obligation to turn off their water. They have an obligation to run their AC at a certain temperature so mold or, and mildew doesn't grow. They have an obligation to uh, periodically inspect their appliances and the connections to their appliances. So you don't have a situation where a water heater goes bad and if they had had somebody inspect it, it would have turned out that they needed to actually replace a hose or a connection um, and it could have caused not only the person on the 10th floor, but everyone below them, a lot of, it could have uh, prevented a lot of headache. So we'll include language in amendments, placing those obligations on the owner. Now, a, a lot of you are probably saying, well, that's kind of burdensome for us to have to actually make sure these folks are complying with these things, that they're having these things inspected, that they're looking at stuff, that they're turning off their water. Yes, it can be burdensome to do that. But one of the main reasons you're adding that language in there is if there is a water issue and you ask the owner, did you turn off the water before you left town? Well, no. Well, our documents require you to do so. 
So your failure to do so is evidence of your negligence and it's a breach, it's a violation of our docs. So you're gonna ultimately be responsible for all damage that ensued as a result. And that's that's one of the reasons for including that language in, in, in the documents. Next slide, please. So floor coverings. Um, this is frequently an issue uh, within uh, high-rise condo buildings. If you live in a high-rise condo and you have the person who wears heels um, all day and all night, uh, you understand what kind of problems uh, uh, this, this can pose. Um, proper soundproofing is important. Um, it does prevent constant noise um, and it's, 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 it's horrible if you live below someone that did not properly soundproof. So what we recommend you do if you're in that kind of situation is adopt and incorporate specifications into your declaration as to what will be acceptable. Get information from an engineer as to what they want to see, what you're gonna require below your hard surface flooring. What kind of sound dampening material are you gonna require? Put that into your declaration or your rules so that way any owner who submits an application for a renovation project, um, they have to also attest to the fact that they are complying with the, uh, the soundproofing and the floor covering guidelines in the declaration or the rules. Okay, next slide. Insurance requirements. Um, we highly recommend that all associations review their insurance requirements, make sure it's consistent with statutes for condominiums, if you're in a townhome community, um, make sure that you are reviewing and make sure there's no gaps in coverage. This frequently comes up where you have a townhome, it's a chapter 720 HOA. Most 720 HOAs, if you're in a single family home, you insure your home, the entire structure, roof, walls, everything. The association is only responsible for the common area. Well, what happens if you have an HOA where a townhome community, where owners don't insure that way. And the association, according to the documents, is only responsible for insuring the common areas. And there's a casualty event that comes through. A lot of owners, they'll obtain a condominium policy in a townhome community that only covers essentially the contents. And then there's this huge gap of coverage in connection with the structure for any kind of casualty event. So when you are in a, a community, it's important to look at the insurance provisions with not only your attorney, but your insurance professional to make sure you don't have huge gaps in coverage. There's also a lot of language in particularly older um, declarations that require you to have an insurance trustee in place to uh, adjust any claims and manage all claims that, that come in. Well, if you're in a, a situation where you've had to try to deal with that, I, I'd love to I'd love to know if it was easy to find someone, <clears throat> excuse me, to serve as an insurance trustee. Most of my clients that have had that situation, they're they're had to have great difficulty in finding someone to serve as an insurance trustee, like a bank. Um, and two, it's expensive to have to have someone serve as an insurance trustee. So all that very archaic language regarding an insurance trustee. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about, it's essentially bringing in an independent third party that's not management or the board to essentially adjust the claim, distribute proceeds, et cetera. Um, so we remove that kind of language from most of the insurance uh, documents that we're, that we're working on, uh, the declarations and, and bylaws, what have you. All right, um, next, next slide. Sales and leasing, this comes up all the time. Um, at, at least if not every day, every other day, I'm answering questions in connection with sales and leasing. If you don't have language in your, in your declaration that gives you the right to approve or deny a sale or a lease, march forward at, at your own peril. Um, I have some clients that like to include that language or want to include that language in your rules and regulations. I caution them against doing so just because if the owners have not voted in favor of it, it's not subject to this presumption of validity. 
it's more a test of reasonableness um, in Florida law. So if you're gonna, if you don't already have language in your documents regarding sales and, and leases, then you really should not be incorporating any kind of uh, restrictions in your in your uh, in your rules. Now, if you have the right in your declaration, it says the association has the right to uh, uh, screen uh, potential renters and purchasers subject to rules adopted by the board. Well, then the board could, can adopt rules. It would be better suited as a declaration amendment to spell it all out. We we recommend highly that you include specific grounds to disapprove a potential purchaser or renter. Um, I know that a lot of old documents have language which may say any uh, anyone convicted of a felony is disqualified from renting or purchasing within our community. Um, HUD a few years ago uh, came out with a guidance memorandum that said automatically rejecting anyone with a felony conviction could have an unintended um, but adverse discriminatory impact because of our country's criminal justice system. This is the information from HUD. So HUD said, what you need to do instead is embark on a case-by-case -case analysis. So someone that was convicted of a felony in the 70s for possessing marijuana may not, uh, the association should potentially not exclude them if they have a clean record since from uh, renting within your community, but someone who has an aggravated assault conviction um, more recently, that's someone who you probably want to exclude, provided you have the grounds to keep them out. So you need to evaluate um, whether the health, safety, or welfare of uh, members within the community or occupants in the community would be impacted by such individual. And, and this is all part of this amendment process. Um, other issues in connection with sales and leasing that we, we frequently recommend and include would be a waiting period on new purchasers being able to rent their units one year or two years. So it's a holding period. They cannot rent for the first 12 months or 24 months of ownership. It's important to just not say that. It's important to go beyond that and specify that if it's rented at the time of purchase, once that current lease expires, then the unit will have to sit vacant or it will need to be owner occupied for that 12 or 24 month period. And it's important to draft amendments that way because people are constantly looking for loopholes, right? So you have a situation where someone is buying as an investor, they know you have the waiting period, but they're intending on leasing the unit. So, and all your documents say is you can't rent for the first 12 months. Well, they'll just sign a lease the day before, the former owner will sign a lease the day before closing for 24 months with a renter. And then you have to honor that lease because it's already in place. Once that 24 month lease expires, there's no holding period. The investor has been able to essentially get around your restrictions uh, and rent the entire time. So it's, you have to be careful um, in connection with how you, um, you draft these amendments and incorporating a lease addendum um, requirement where you are essentially requiring the, um, the owner, tenant and association to sign an addendum, which essentially says, we agree that we will be bound by the terms of the documents, even though they are by law anyway. And acknowledging that the association can take legal action against the owner and the tenant in the event there are any violations of the governing documents. Short of that, the association is not going to be able to take um, action to evict an owner because it's not a party to the lease. But by having the lease addendum, the association essentially becomes a party to the lease agreement. And this is all incorporated and, uh, and carefully crafted in connection with amendments that you can have prepared. Uh, next slide, please. Fining. This is something that I think 50% or more of associations, now it's, it's, it's changed a little bit because the law has become a little bit more clear, but five years ago, everyone was handling this in a different way and more than half of the associations weren't handling it the proper way. 
So if you are a member of an association where you fine owners for violations of your docs, and this is how your procedure works, uh, it's wrong. If you send a letter and say, we have fined you $100 for leaving your trash cans at the curb, and you have 14 days to request a hearing. If you don't request a hearing, the fine is imposed. If that's you, that's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because the fining procedure is very specific by statute. You have to um, have a fining committee in place, which is made up of three people who aren't on the board, aren't related to board members. Um, and the fining committee's sole task is to decide whether to confirm or reject a fine. Well, a fining committee cannot take action to confirm a fine unless it's at a properly noticed fining committee meeting. So what you have to do is you have to provide a letter to the owner saying the fining committee meeting is scheduled for X date, at least 14 days from now, and give that person an opportunity to appear. If they don't appear, that's fine. No pun intended. If they don't appear, that's okay. But the fining committee actually has to meet. If they don't meet, you cannot have a fine in place. So a lot of times we are removing language from declarations and bylaws that and in, yeah, putting additional language in that says the, stat, the, the association will follow the fining procedure set forth in chapter 718 or 720 um, and the board has the power to adopt rules and regulations procedures you know, from time to time. One of the things for HOAs, if you're in a condo, you're limited by statute. $100 a day up to uh, 10 days for a continuing violation and they cannot become a lien on the property. In an HOA, you can adopt larger fines and you can also amend your documents to provide that fines of more than $1,000 can become a lien on the property. So if you have those serial violators or you live in a community where people don't care about $100, and they're going to they're just going to you know pay the hundred dollars every time. Well, for serious violations or repeat offenders, you can amend your documents to provide higher fines, whether it's two fifty per violation, up to twenty five hundred dollars, and say that anything over a thousand dollars can become a lien on the property, subject to foreclosure as any other amount that uh, would be owed for assessments. That's something you would have to amend into your documents, and again, that's only for an HOA. Next slide. Pets. You know, pets parking and leasing are the uh, three most um, common sources of dispute within communities. Um, if you do not have any pet restrictions right now and you want to incorporate them, you can. We do not recommend that you um, incorporate any kind of amendments that would require somebody to remove their existing pet from the community, but rather say that we will grandfather in any pet that existed as of the date of this amendment, um, provided you provide us with a registration form and proof that you had this pet prior to this date. And once that pet passes away, you will not be able to replace them with a pet unless it complies with the existing documents. Um, that's how we deal with that issue a lot. Um, you, we can draft amendments in connection with dangerous and aggressive breeds. Um, or um, if you don't wanna have an outright restriction on aggressive breeds, but banning dangerous animals, then there's a whole um, uh, an amendment um, uh, regime we can put in place for, for that. Um, this does not apply to an assistance animal under the Fair Housing Act. Um, I know we talked about this at the very beginning, but this is such a, um, a hotly disputed and sore subject for so many communities that I want to make sure everyone understands if it is an assistance animal, a properly documented assistance animal under the Fair Housing Act, it doesn't matter if it is a 200 pound bull mastiff and you have a 20 pound weight limit. You're not going to be able to exclude it from the, uh, from the building. 99% of the time, unless the animal exhibits aggressive tendencies, what have you. Um, just something to keep in mind um, as you go through this and to involve your attorney and property manager 
in dealing with those issues because they can become sticky. Um, okay, next slide. Parking and permitted vehicles. So uh, in a lot of condos, a lot of HOAs, um, people do not want to see the commercial vehicles um, with the commercial lettering or the ladders on the outside of the vehicle or, or anything else that would be, you know, large, oversized, et cetera. Well, you need to include the specific language in your documents. If you have language that just says commercial vehicles, it may not be good enough. Now, you could explain commercial vehicles in your rules, but that would be a rule amendment. But you should define the vehicle by the exterior appearance, not just the primary use. So if you're going to have someone who has um, uh, you know, a standard size sedan and they have lettering on the back of the car on the window, is that something you want to exclude? Or, or what are you really aiming at? Are you aiming at the large oversized vehicles where um, it either won't fit into parking spaces um, if you have a tight parking lot or um, the ma vast majority of your community doesn't like the look of it? Um, in connection with parking, it de in your, if you're in a condo um, and you have parking spaces that are limited common elements, and it specifies that in your declaration, you cannot have owners willy-nilly exchanging, selling parking spaces, unless your declaration specifically allows the exchange of limited common element parking spaces. A limited common element, by definition, is something that is a pertinent to the unit means it attaches to. So when you sell a unit, the parking space travels with it. Unless your documents provide a vehicle um, by which you can exchange or um, reassign those limited common element parking spaces. If you're in a condo and it makes no mention of the, uh, the uh, of any spaces as being limited common elements, then they're all common elements. You cannot assign them permanently to a particular unit. You can grant owners in certain situations exclusive, uh, not exclusive rights, but assign exclusive rights to use while they are the owner. But the association can reassign those spaces um, at will. It's important to also be specific on prohibited vehicles and other stored items outside of a garage. So if you don't want motorcycles, boats, what have you in an HOA outside of a garage, you need to say that in your documents. If you want them obscured from view, um, say that. If you don't want them parked in the backyard where somebody just opens up the fence, pulls it back there and fine, it's not parked in the front of the house, but you have, um, you know, the, the tuna tower going up ab high above the, the roof line of the house. If it's not in your documents, it's not prohibited. Um, and then it's also important to talk about temporary parking of boats and RVs, particularly in an HOA, because people are going to come to load up an RV before they utilize it, or they're going to load up a boat when it's trailered before they take it on a trip. Um, so if you don't want that at all within your community, it needs to be specified, but most HOAs are reasonable in saying that you can, you're allowed to have it for loading or unloading, no more than 12 hours or no more than 24 hours, et cetera. And that's something that should be addressed in your uh, declaration, um, in the use restrictions or in uh, rules and regulations. <clears throat> Next slide. Architectural control, um, particularly uh, um, problematic with respect to HOAs. The ARC, the ACC, the DRC, whatever, um, uh, three letter combination your community uses, it has to be handled in the same manner as a board meeting. You need to make sure you need to address if there is, is going to be a right to uh, appeal um, those, those, uh, those decisions. And associations should be really careful with authority provided to committees, specifically an ARC committee. Because if you give the ARC committee sole authority and your documents give the ARC uh, committee sole authority to publish and develop guidelines and then approve or reject applications. What happens when the guidelines aren't reasonable? 
because the ARC is not necessarily going to have access to the association's attorney and having it reviewed by counsel. Um, and when the application is rejected, the association's manager and or attorney or board is the one who gets served with a demand letter from the owner's attorney. Uh, and the board then has to deal with it. So frequently what we recommend is the board functions as the ARC because unless your documents prohibit it, the board and the ARC can be one and the same. Or you have the board sit as the final, the body with the final approval and the ARC just makes recommendations to the board um, or the board is the appellate body. So if the ARC denies something, it goes up on appeal to the board and then the board can correct problems that the ARC potentially creates. The other thing um, that we see is short time periods for ARC to approve, such as upon receipt of the application, the board has, or the ARC has 15 days to respond or else it will be deemed approved. Well, somebody submits something December 15th and no one's there, that's a way to kind of slip in a bunch of stuff um, towards the end of the year because everyone's gone for the holidays and then it's automatically approved. So increase it to 60 days or increase it to say if the association has not provided um, approval, it's deemed denied, not deemed approved. And this is these are all amendments that can be worked into the ARC provisions of, uh, of an HOA. Next slide. clear authority for rules and regulations. For um, HOAs and condos, there's frequently language that deal with rules that it's not clear as to whether it applies to common areas or common elements or lots or units. It'll say that the association has the a, a power to adopt rules and regulations governing the use of the common elements. Well, does if it doesn't say units, you may wanna add that language just as a belt and suspenders type of approach to give the association the authority. The other issue that we frequently see come up, and typically it's not, your declaration will have language regarding rules that the board has the ability to adopt rules and regulations. And then buried in the articles of incorporation, it'll say the, the board has the power to adopt rules and regulations subject to the approval of two thirds of all members. So as part of a comprehensive review, if you have language that would require the membership to approve rules and regulations, you may want to remove that. Um, and if you don't want to completely remove it, we've done this a number of times where the board has the power to adopt the rules. And then after the rules are adopted, a majority of all members can uh, petition the association to strike down a rule. So that way it doesn't prevent the board from implementing something, but if, if it's important to enough members, they can strike something down. Um, and that's something that we've seen and worked with clients on. Next slide. Age restrictions. Unless you're an HFOP, which um, is a housing for older persons, such as a 55 and up or 65 and up community, if you have any language restricting age within your governing documents, it's a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Um, which brings us to a really important point about DNO coverage. Whenever you are renewing your insurance policies, this is a question all of you should ask of your insurance agent and property managers is, do we have broad form insurance coverage that includes claims for violation of the Civil Rights Act? And the reason the Civil Rights Act is important is because the Fair Housing Act was born out of the Civil Rights Act and that is what it incorporates. So if you have an owner, and this goes back to the Fair Housing Act with assistance animals or for uh, denying people with felony convictions, all of those things, it's really easy for an owner to file a complaint against an association for violation of the Fair Housing Act. Once that happens, it become, can become quite expensive and sometimes the attorney's fees and costs are more expensive than any kind of damages or corrective measure the association would need to take. If you have this broad form insurance coverage, then you should have coverage for the defense that would be necessary, the attorney's fees that would be necessary to defend against those kind of claims. Um, and that's really important. So make sure 
um, you talk to your insurance agent and property manager about those issues. Next slide. Okay, HOA issues. I know we talked a lot about different condo related matters, um, but uh, 72303, when you're dealing with HOA reserves, condos, it's very detailed, very specific. HOAs, it's very, it, it's, it's um, a lot of if this, but that, maybe this, then that within the statute relating to an HOA's obligation to fund reserves. So we can incorporate amendments into your documents that specify what the association's specific obligations are with respect to uh, reserves for capital expenditures and deferred maintenance. We can also, um, as we discussed before, put limitations on increases in budget um, and adoption of special assessments in HOA documents. Elections are one of the um, primary things that HOA bylaws need to be amended to address because frequently you're in an HOA and they've been doing the condo style election. They come to me, they say, well, we've been doing this for years. The two uh, ballot envelope system, um, you know, a secret ballot. Well, what do your documents say? Well, the documents just say we have to have an election um, and um, that nominations are permitted from the floor. Well, then you've been doing everything wrong. The HOA, um, the reference to HOA elections in chapter 720 says you have to conduct elections pursuant to the governing documents. So if the governing documents say you meet at high noon and draw straws to figure out who gets on the board, which I know for some of you may feel like you're, you drawn the short straw by being on the board, but um, that's what you have to do. So we frequently work with associations to amend the election procedures. So maybe you don't permit nominations from the floor. The benefit of not permitting nominations from the floor, which you have to do unless your governing documents have a specific procedure for nominations in advance. 720 says if you have a specific procedure for nominations in advance, you don't need to permit nominations from the floor at the meeting. That's really important nowadays with all these Zoom meetings. If you're in an HOA and it has been very difficult for you to have an annual meeting and an election because you are your board doesn't want to get together in person, your members don't want to get together in person, and your documents require a secret ballot, how are you going to do a secret ballot on Zoom? So there are things that associations have done. I won't go into that to, to kind of work through that process, but it'd be much simpler for an association to say, we're going to require owners to submit a notice of intent X number of days in advance. We're not permitting nominations from the floor. And that way you'll know ahead of time, well in advance of the meeting, whether an election is necessary. That's something that we frequently work with associations on amending. Um, townhomes, one of the more complicated structures in connection with particularly maintenance responsibility. Because a townhome, you own right up to the property line, which your property line is right in the middle of a wall you share with a neighbor. So who bears the maintenance obligations for certain things on the exterior and the interior and the roof? Those are things that should be in a right for amendment in most townhome declarations. Um, and then uh, one of the other things is, uh, is business use of homes. Um, a lot of documents outright prohibit any commercial use of, of, of homes. Now, if that happened over the past year, every single one of your, your members has been in violation because they've been handling Zoom meetings for work in, in the house. So we also work with our clients on amending that language to exempt uh, the type of business that would not result in increased foot traffic um, or uh, visible commercial activity from the outside of the home. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Bylaws and the articles. Um, we've talked about um, the relationship as far as the hierarchy goes. A lot of times the articles will refer to the bylaws, the bylaws will refer to the articles for what procedure is necessary. It's better if they just are self -encap en en encapsulating and the articles handle what the articles need to and the bylaws handle what they need to. Um, the election procedures we've discussed, um, if you want to have continuity on the board, uh, you can amend your documents to provide for staggered terms of office where everyone's term doesn't uh, expire on the same year. You can uh, specify how many members um, you want on the board. If you want a five-member board 
and your documents say you have between three and nine positions, you can narrow that by amendment to say you just want five people. Um, the same thing for quorum requirements, how many members have to participate for you to have a valid membership meeting. Um, and then electronic and virtual meetings. This is something that's come up so frequently over the past year um, that we'd recommend that you include um, specific authorization in your documents for electronic and virtual meetings going forward, provided owners have a right to participate. Um, next slide. Um, and then rules and regulations. Um, we've talked about rules and regulations a lot uh, tangentially. Um, for Florida HOAs, you have to record notice for any rule changes um, in, in the public records. Satellite dishes, we've spoken about those um, as well, as far as what you, uh, that you do need to permit them, but you can adopt guidelines in connection with them. Vehicles, um, participation for unit owners, um, you can uh, provide specific authorization and guidelines for how that's going to happen. Um, procedures for inspection and copying of records. If you have owners within your community that are requesting records on a daily basis, um, the law permits you to make it um, uh, a little bit more difficult um, for owners to um, request to inspect and copy records. And not because they want to make it difficult, but because you want to have a specific procedure in place that things don't slip through the cracks. Finding procedures, as we already talked about, um, in condos, you can adopt rules regarding how frequently you have to respond to written questions from owners. Um, and then you need to be careful on limiting use of uh, facilities by children. There are certain um, ages. Um, you don't want to prohibit someone who's anyone who's a minor from using the swimming pool without adult supervision. Um, but someone under 13 um, potentially would, would be okay without it violating the Fair Housing Act. And, and the, last, the, the last thing we'll talk about, I'm going to go to the next slide before we go to questions, would be if you're in a Florida HOA, you need to take action to preserve your governing documents from expiring. Um, the Marketable Record Title Act, it's a renewal that's required every 30 years from the original declaration. If, you, if the documents have expired, there's a procedure in place for revitalizing, for breathing life back into those restrictions. But if you're sitting here and you're on an HOA board and your documents are older than 30 years and nothing has happened since then, you need to call your attorney this afternoon and make sure that you're doing everything that you need to do. Um, and with that, you, um, Neil, I see that we have a number of questions there. Do you want to open it up to questions? Yes, we'll go ahead and open that. So do you want to go through those questions, Neil, and, and, and tell me what we're looking at? I can go ahead and, and answer um, or ask a couple of questions. Um, so the first one is from Cynthia. Can you amend your docs? to no smoking and common walkways and area? Um, it's been a frequent uh, question that has come up um, in recent years. And I have a lot of clients that have inquired and if they're not in the process of, they're uh, strongly considering amending to um, limit and or restrict smoking in common elements and, and you know balconies, uh, things along those lines. But yes, you can, if you have a pool area um, and you don't want folks smoking in and around the pool area, you want to have a designated smoking area, you can, that's okay. Okay, and our next question, we've got, um, can you have Aaron explain the apathy factor, how the two-step amendment process for the first amendment is a vote on percentage? Yeah, so what I meant by apathy is you have people who just don't participate. So the first step of getting owners to approve the amendment to the amendment procedure is going to be challenging. You're going to have to go door to door sometimes. You're going to have to call people. You're going to have to politic to get it done. You may have to continue your meeting where you show up to the scheduled meeting. You don't have the requisite number of people who have submitted proxies. So you announce at the meeting, we're going to continue this meeting to another specific date and time where we, so we can uh, obtain some, some more proxies from folks. Um, so we can um, uh, try to get this passed. 
But you, at that point, your monetary investment is a lot less. You have not invested significant resources into amending the documents. So that's what I mean by the two-step factor. After you've done that, then the apathy shouldn't be an issue. Then um, future amendments, um, it'll just be those that participate. Great. Um, we also have another question. Does the newly consolidated amended document need to be approved by owners? So if you're going to, we recommend whenever you're going to um, consolidate a document and record it, that it would be approved by the, the, the membership. Um, but most of the time when you're consolidating a, a document where you have 15 different amendments, there's always something else that the board wants to approve, um, another amendment that the board wants to approve. Um, and then you have that amendment or all those different amendments incorporated as well and then have it recorded. Um, so, yeah. Okay, and this one is kind of a lengthy question. Can an HOA amend the covenants by the amendment procedures contained in the covenants to add, quote, unless otherwise required by law, any government documents are amendable by two thirds vote of the membership in person or by proxy when a quorum has been attained, end quote, or attorney approved verbiage if the covenant passed, would that allow a resident vote to amend our bylaws that currently state they are amended by a vote of the directors? No resident vote required. Yeah, so if you have a, if you have, if your bylaws currently permit the board to amend the bylaws, but the board says, you know, we don't trust what future boards are going to do. So we want to, we want to amend the bylaws to state that future amendments need a membership approval. You can do that. Perfect. Uh, next question, HOA assessments. Can you weigh annual assessments based on services some owners receive that other owners may not? You cannot change how owners share in the payment of assessments unless 100% of the owners consent to it. So if you have specific language in your documents and this is how your owners are supposed to share in things, but you know it hasn't been equitable over time. If your documents are set up that way, unless 100% of your owners vote in favor of it, you can't do that. Uh, Neil, this one is directed to you. Um, does Vesta have a set of documents for condos that incorporate most of what is discussed here today, um, like a gold standard? How would we get a copy of these? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Mr. Franklin asks, uh, does VESTA have a set of documents for condos that incorporate most of what is discussed here today, like a gold standard? How would we get a copy of these? Uh, no, we don't. We don't have a, a, a gold standard. Um, I would recommend if you wanted to uh, go on the public websites for Hillsborough County or Pinellas County, you can pull various um, uh, documents from there and kind of and thumb through those and, and maybe put something together for yourself. And, and, I, and I'll say this too, just to add on to what, what Neil said, every community is different. So you need to take a look at what your community, your current community's needs and what the owners really want. So some of these things can be translated to a lot of different uh, communities. Um, but as far as being gold standard, even if you start from you know, a quote unquote form document that you've used in the past, there's so many changes by the time you're to something that is finalized. Um, so there isn't any quote unquote gold standard. Um, nor do I think uh, Vesta would, you know, they, they may say, oh, here's another client that we work with. Here, here's their documents, but there, I, I doubt that they're going to pull together documents to provide to you and say, here's something you can start working from. Um, and this is, you know, kind of our form because everything is so different. We have another question here uh, that asks, we have language in our declarations and rules about approval and right of first refusal. However, local realtors frequently ignore these rules and do not notify the association of an offer to purchase. Do you have any suggestions? Um, yeah, so it depends on the language in your documents. Um, this is something where you can 
actually, if, if you have language in your documents that say any sale is, is void or voidable, if you don't follow through with these procedures, once you get that, that information from the, um, depending on the language in your docs, and I encourage you to talk to your own counsel, but once you get an estoppel letter, um, requesting an estoppel certificate, it requires you to provide information such as there is a right of first refusal and they haven't complied. Um, that's a way to deal with it. If the sale has closed and there was no estoppel certificate requested, the association could take legal action against the former and new owner. Okay, we have one more. Um, the Insurance Institute has a dangerous breed list. This is in regard to the pet policy. Can we simply reference this list for restrictions? Um, you, you can, um, but you don't know how it's gonna change from time to time. Um, so what we do is we'll include, a, and then it requires people to actually go to and search out that information. So we will include language on what we consider to be, you know, on that list and say, as well as any other, uh, you know, breeds considered to be potentially dangerous by the board of directors from time to time. So the, the more homework you're requiring owners to do jumping from one document to the next, the more difficult it becomes. Right, Neil? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and let's see here. What if the declarations talk about certain things like parking and the rules were written to repeat what is already in the declarations? As long as they're not inconsistent, I see that all the time. They, they use their rules, they copy and paste language from the declaration, that's fine. As long as it's not inconsistent um, or contrary to the language in the declaration. If the declaration um, is broad and you want to be uh, more restrictive, as long as it's not contrary to the declaration, you can do that. Okay, uh, let's see. Our governing documents prohibit having a business in a home. However, years ago, we had a home purchased and converted to a care facility with four to six residents uh, with caretakers that are employed to come daily. I believe the HOA tried to remove the business. However, they were unable to do so. Is there an exception if if it is this type of business. Um, there, there could potentially be an exception to that business. That's the kind of thing that I would, uh, encourage you to speak to your current counsel about and it depends on the language in your docs um, and, you know, county code um, and, and, and other things. Uh, can you, can you speak to the Kaufman language as amended from time to time. Why should we have this in our documents? Are there any reason not to add it to our documents? Right now, our association is operating on laws passed before 2004. Yeah, so the Kaufman language for everyone uh, uh, on the call, there was a, a case by the name Kaufman was one of the parties. And the uh, court said that if you wanted to incorporate statutory changes into the future, you include language that says, Chapter 720 or Chapter 718 means the Florida Condominium Act and as it may be amended from time to time. What that does is as the statute changes over the years, you're incorporating the changes to the statute into your documents and you're not kind of locked in place. Um, it as far as whether you want to include it, um, the, the risk of including it is if the legislature adds something to your documents that you don't want um, in the future, um, then it could potentially be problematic. Um, we're talking about substantive changes, not procedural changes. Um, but it does have some benefits to the community, um, such as, you know, the safe harbor changes um, within, uh, within uh, assessment collection uh, matters and, and, and things uh, along the similar lines. So most of my clients do want to incorporate it because it makes it easier moving forward to, um, to benefit from changes in the laws. Um, some associations are, are, are wary of it, but those, those, those are few. Okay, if our master HOA 
has made comprehensive amendments regarding leasing, vehicle restriction, restrictions, parking, et cetera. Can we include those as a reference only in our docs or must we state them in ours as well? If, if your master association, so if your owners, your owners, your members are responsible for adhering to the use restrictions of the master community, then you don't have to restate them in your docs, but you can um, to make it easier for your, your membership. But that would, if you're going to add something in, it would need to be approved just like any other amendment. Okay, and just a, a couple more, because I know we're running out of time here. Uh, we have a CDD and an HOA. CDD controls common areas. How does HOA enforce the CDD to keep up the common areas as the way HOA enforces a homeowner? Should the CDD be responsible for easement maintenance between road and sidewalk, the first 10 feet from the road? All of that is going to be subject to the CDD documents and it's an individualized analysis. So if you have a CDD and they're not doing what they should be doing based on, on the documents and their requirements, then that's a question you should definitely talk to your council about because you're paying for those things um, as, as part of uh, your, your, your fees to the CDD. Okay, can a landlord's prohibition of pets and a unit be trumped by a tenant's claim of a properly authorized service or support animal? So if the, it, that's an issue between the, the, the landlord and the tenant, right? So if you allow pets within your building and the individual owner does not want to permit pets, that's an issue that they will have to deal with uh, on their own. Um, the only thing the association should be concerned with should, would be whether the association is required to permit an accommodation, which would be an exception to its own restrictions and rules. Okay. Um, in lieu of fining, can documents say that any costs incurred in returning property to original condition will be borne by the violator. This is primarily for when owners put plans or property on common property or of the association. Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so my, my camera froze for whatever reason. Um, but yes, you can include language in the documents that require owners to make payment for um, any um, damages that they cause or any violations that they commit, et cetera. But if it's in a condo, it's not going to be lienable because it's not a common expense. Um, if it's in an HOA, you can uh, amend your documents if it's not already there to make it as a specific assessment uh, assessable only against that one unit. And it could be lienable. Um, Okay, and one more. If we have very old docs, can we view docs from another condo association online and incorporate those, essentially change the name, or do we have to go online, line by line in old docs? Um, if, you're, if you have very old docs and you wanna completely rewrite the documents, um, there are certain things you can't change, right? So you cannot change the unit boundaries in a condo. You, you can't change how people share in the payment of expenses. Um, so, if you're gonna completely scrap everything and start fresh, you can do that for most of it and then put at the top, instead of doing the underlines and strike throughs, um, put at the top that these, uh, the, amendment, uh, the amendments have, are a substantial rewording of the current documents, see current documents for uh, existing text, but you can't just automatically um, you can't just automatically uh, wipe out everything because there are certain things that can't be changed without 100% approval. Okay, and I've got one more for you, Aaron, if you have time. Um, and this is kind of going back to the, the governing document um, change question. Um, so the question regarding the governing document change was asking if the co covenants contained the new language, any governing document may be amended. Would that allow residents to vote to change bylaws that currently only allow the, a director vote? Uh, 
Did we lose Aaron? I'm not sure he, he left and came back, but I can't I can't see or hear him. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm here. So I wasn't sure if you heard my last question, but um, the question regarding the governing document change was asking if the covenants contains the new language, any governing document may be amended, et cetera. Would that allow residents to vote to change bylaws that currently only allowed director vote? Yes. So if, if, if the, well, if, if right now, if right now your bylaws provide that the directors, this is how the directors are to vote to change the bylaws and the bylaws are only going to be approved by the directors, then the way the documents are to be amended is for the directors to vote to change them. If you have members that aren't happy with the bylaws and the directors that are okay with them, run for the board next year. And then you'll be in the position of amending and changing those. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to, uh, Aaron, I'm going to, if you don't mind, uh, include your contact info in the chat screen. Um, sure. Neil, I will also, um, I'll do the same for you. And there's Aaron and Neil's info as well. And as Sebastian mentioned at the beginning, um, this webinar was recorded and it will be available on our website, uh, vestapropertyservices.com forward slash webinars um, later on today or tomorrow, if you guys wanted to share it with uh, other board members or other owners, residents uh, within your associations. Wonderful. Well, I, I want to thank everyone for uh, taking the time uh, this afternoon to, to listen to me, uh, you know, talk to myself on, on the computer. Um, and um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself, to Neil. Um, happy to, to help. And uh, a, a big thank you to, uh, to Vesta and the entire team for uh, inviting me to present.